all so much for joining us and being our wonderful virtual dive buddies from all across the world. On this week's episode, we are going to be speaking a little bit about coral reef threats, uh, how life on reefs can adapt to these threats, and what scientists are doing in terms of restoration going into the future. Today we are broadcasting live from Martha's Vineyard, which is a lovely dive site here just off the Bloody Bay Wall uh, in off the coast, sorry, of Little Cayman, which is a tiny, tiny island in the Caribbean with a population of under 200 people. I'm Fiona, I'm going to be your topside host for today. Underwater, we have Tom, who's going to be your underwater host and my lovely, lovely co-presenter. Uh, he is going to be answering your questions and having a little conversation with me live from just under this boat here. Uh, and him and the underwater team are going to be wearing special scuba gear, which includes a mic and headphones so that we can talk to each other and you guys will be able to hear him speak. Uh, so let's take a moment now to say hi to them. Hi, Tom. Hey, everybody. So I'm Tom. I'm the field station manager here at CCMI. And I'm really excited to be able to show you some wonderful examples of biodiversity from the reef here today. Thanks, Tom. Now, Tom and I are not the only two people making this whole thing possible. There's a whole other team of people around us, including people on top of the, uh, on top of the water, under the water, behind cameras, um, producing the whole thing. So let's take a moment to say hi to Lars, Beth, Sabrina, and Lowell. Hello. Uh, so a couple of things I want to mention right off the bat. We love to hear your guys' questions and comments at any point throughout the broadcast. So there is a little chat box to the right-hand side of the screen. So at any point, feel free to drop a little question or comment in there. And just please include your first name, your age, and your location, which can be the name of your school or the state or country you're in. Um, it are watching later, we do have educational materials available, uh, and those are linked in the video description, and we're also going to drop, th drop that in the chat box right now as well. If you are not already subscribed, you can do so just by clicking that big red button, uh, and you can register for more Reefs Go Live specific material through our website. Uh, you will hear me checking in on Tom and the underwater team throughout the broadcast. This is completely safe and normal. If any of you out there are divers, you'll know it's safe diving practice to be checking in on your buddies throughout the dive. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that now. Tom, how are you and Sabrina doing down there? Sabrina, are you okay? All good, thanks Tom. And Lowell's okay, and I am fantastic too. Thank you for asking. So really excited to get started on our topic today, talking about some of the big threats to coral reefs, how they can adapt, and what we can do to give them a helping hand. Awesome. Tom, I'm glad to hear you guys are doing all right down there. So today's Reefs Go Live, we're going to build a little bit on what we spoke about last week. If you guys tuned in last week, you will remember that we spoke about uh, biodiversity, what biodiversity is, uh, why it's so important to us, why, why it's threatened, and what all of us all around the world can do to have a better impact on our planet. So today we're going to just have a deeper, try and get a deeper understanding of some of those threats that we spoke about last week. We're going to be looking at examples of these threats and declining reef health here at Martha's Vineyard today, and we're also going to be looking at what our team is doing to try and combat those threats. We're going to wrap up our episode by speaking a little bit about the important actions and how all of us can give the reefs a better future. So to get started, coral reefs are a very delicate, biodiverse ecosystem. Um, all components that live in, all components within that reef live in a constant dynamic interaction with each other. That interaction does depend on the health of each of those individuals within that ecosystem. So what could influence that health? Well, within an ecosystem, you have biotic and abiotic factors. Biotic factors would be all those living things within an ecosystem, which would include things from sharks and rays and bigger creatures, all the way down to little things like nudibranchs and algae, corals, sponges. Uh, Tom, would you be able to show us some examples of some biotic factors down there around you? I certainly can, Fiona. So just to Sabrina's right, we have this wonderful little school of chop here that are cruising past. So, excuse me. So they're a lovely little herbivorous fish. And you can see 
either side of them around on the reef so we have all these wonderful different species of corals, sea fans like gorgonians and things like that. So we have some lovely examples of sponges around in this area too. So it's a whole lot of different life. Thank you, Tom. Uh, that is a fantastic snapshot of some of the biodiverse life and biotic factors that we have here in Little Cayman. Uh, now, we also have abiotic factors, and these are all the things that are non-living that also um, affect the ecosystem. So they are equally responsible for that ecosystem in terms of what it looks like, how it functions, and what can be contained within that ecosystem. Some examples of abiotic factors would be light, uh, temperature, water depth, and salinity. Uh, Tom, could you give us any examples of some abiotic factors around you at the moment? Well, Fiona, I'm currently at a depth of 12.6 meters. And the water temperature down here is a balmy 29 degrees centigrade. Now, as you can see, at this depth, we have lots and lots of light penetrating down. And the visibility for Little Cayman is just a little bit stirred up, and it still has this amazing visibility, all of this light penetrating through. Now, we also have just a little bit of surface chop, so you can see all of the fans around just, just gently swaying with the swell but we don't have a whole lot of current, so there's no massive water movement back and forth. Now, as scientists, we don't rely on things like dive computers to give us this data. We actually have a whole, or a whole suite of instrumentation, like different data loggers that we can leave on the reef, and they help us to track over longer periods of time what's going on on the reef. Now I'd like our dive buddies back home just to have a little think about what abiotic factors are after the environment around them. Thank you, Tom. So now we know what these factors are, we want to think about what might change them and what might happen to the ecosystem as a result of any changes. So human activity can actually alter both biotic and abiotic factors extremely. One example would be overexploitation of a species, maybe by overfishing. That would be an example of a human impact on a biotic factor. You can also get pollution and development caused by humans, which will affect the turbidity uh, and clarity of the water. And you could also get fertilizer and chemical runoff, which can really affect the level of nutrients and dissolved molecules within that water, which can have a huge impact um, because it can actually make it difficult or even impossible for different fish and creatures to breathe. Um, climate change uh, is, and the knock-on effects of climate change can be considered one of the greatest, if not the greatest, negative impact on the planet. So let's break that statement a little bit down a little bit more and just focus on what climate change is. Uh, to put it very, very basically, climate change um, Humans use a lot of fossil fuels uh, for loads of different things, like fueling cars, planes, powering and heat houses. Um, and that means that there are greater amounts of greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide and methane. This traps heat in our atmosphere, which in turn means that the global average temperature is increasing. Now, coral is very used to a certain temperature. So with this global average temperature increasing, that means the water temperature is also increasing. And that means that the coral becomes uncomfortable and actually stressed as a result and might expel its symbiont, which is the algae zooxanthellae. Uh, and zooxanthellae lives in coral and actually provides it with the majority of its food and energy. So now this coral is stressed already and isn't getting enough energy or food. That means it's very, very vulnerable. And then any added stressor, such as higher temperature or harmful bacteria, means that a coral is very susceptible to get very, very sick and even die. Uh, Tom, could you explain a little bit more about why changes in environment can have such a big impact on biodiversity? I certainly can, Fiona. So looking around on the reef through here, we, all, we have all of these sessile or benthic organisms, like the different corals and sponges and sea fans. 
Now when there's a big change to their environment, they're not able just to pack up and move away, they're fixed in place. Now living amongst these things, there's also lots of different little worms and crabs and shrimp and things like that. They might be able to travel, but they can't move big distances. So they're the things that are dramatically affected by changes in their environment. Now luckily what we do find is that some species or some individuals within these species are actually able to exhibit some ability to adapt. Uh, exactly, Tom. And we know that these species are able to adapt and actually thrive occasionally through plasticity or evolutionary adaptation. Uh, so to explain plasticity, we can describe it as being the ability of an individual or a species to adapt to changes in its environment or differences in its various habitats. To offer a little bit more clarity on that, ex on that definition, uh, we can talk about an example here in Little Cayman. A while back there was a very big hurricane and it actually picked up some tarpon from the ocean and washed them up over the land and into one of the lakes here, now funnily enough called Tarpon Lake. Um, and those tarpon actually managed to survive and they live there quite happily now despite a bunch of factors including brackish water, uh, much greater changes in salinity. They have to deal with a higher temperature and a greater range in temperatures. Uh, they have a much more limited diet in a lake than they would in the ocean and their bodies have actually adapted to be slightly smaller to deal with the lack of space there. Tom, could you give us any more examples of plasticity that you could see on the reef around you? Can Fiona. So I have below me here an example of a colony of staghorn coral. Now where we are at this relatively shallow depth with lots of light, you'll see it grows kind of up towards the surface with these lovely fat branches. Now this same species at depth would form more of a sort of basket like much wider flatter structure with much skinnier branches and that's to maximize the amount of light it can get. We've also found with this species that some individuals when they've been exposed to higher temperatures over an extended period of time actually exhibit a greater tolerance to these higher temperatures. It's fantastic. And looking around on the reef across here, we can also see all of these different boulder corals. They have these lovely rounded structures here up in the shallows. But at greater depth, they're actually more likely to form much wider, flatter plates. And that is again to maximize the amount of light that they can capture. Those are some great examples, Tom. How are you and Sabrina doing down there? Sabrina, you're all good? All good, thanks, Tom. And I am excellent, thank you. All right, great, that's what we like to hear. Uh, so eventually, that individual plasticity that Tom and I were talking about has the possibility of contributing to the evolution of a species through adaptation, and this is the other thing we mentioned earlier. We can describe this as being the genetic alteration in body shape and behavior, which improves the species' ability to survive, and these genes are generally uh, passed down to the species' offspring. Uh, Tom, would you be able to give us any examples of some evolutionary adaptation on the reef there? Well, looking around me here, we have at the moment, I mentioned these lovely big sea fans earlier. Now, if you can get in a little bit closer to them, you see they have this really nice, tightly interlaced woven branch. And that helps them to maximize the amount of food that they can capture as they're wafting through the current. You might notice this as well on the reef. There's lots of different nooks and crannies and algae and things like that. And some fish species, like the burfish, have actually adapted their body's coloration to very closely mimic these patterns of colorations in a form of cryptic camouflage. Now also, as we might see in front and to the right of me, there's all this sand. 
and for species like flounder, they've actually evolved a very flat body shape where they can hide just under the sand. And their coloration also mimics that color. Well, that Thank you, Tom. Uh, now we have a quick question for you from Sam in the UK who wants to know, was that staghorn a coral that CCMI outplanted here? Well, Sam, I'm not actually sure if this is one of our pieces of staghorn coral. Unfortunately, I've only been in Little Cayman for about three months now. So I'm still finding out where all our little pieces have gone to. Thank you, Tom, and thank you for the explanations of evolutionary adaptation on the reef here. So back to our coral, uh, at CCMI, we are trying to find examples of individuals that are able to survive a whole host of different threats, including increasing water temperatures and different coral diseases. Uh, we believe they are able to do this through plasticity, and so we are trying to grow more of these uh, individuals that are able to do that within our nursery, and then outplant these into the local reefs as Sam just asked us about. Uh, so we do outplant these corals, meaning we take them from our nursery and put them back on the reef and try and get them to grow there back in their homes. Uh, we hope that over generations, this will become an adaptive response and that will mean a higher likelihood of survival for corals on our reefs here. So let's talk a little bit more about the CCMI nursery and how we hope to help coral reefs going into the future. So the primary species that we grow here at CCMI is staghorn coral or Acropora cervicornis. Tom, can you tell us why this species is so important? I certainly can, Fiona. So this staghorn coral like this, it used to be a dominant species on the reefs here in the Caribbean. It's also very important as a reef building species. It's a stony coral. It forms these fantastic big structures, these big reefs. And it was so dominant that actually some reefs in the region are named for that species. Now unfortunately in the 1980s, this species exhibited a massive die-off. Up to 90 to 95 percent of the, uh, the corals disappeared, and that was linked to a disease called white band disease. Now, globally, this coral species is actually considered critically endangered, and that's a massive shame because it is such a really like important species here on the reef, forming these lovely intricate structures that provides wonderful habitat for different fish and you know, all, all these different species here. Thank you, Tom. Uh, exactly. And in response to this huge die-off uh, that we had, ocean lovers decided that action had to be taken. Uh, so there are many things that we can do to try and slow down climate change and the rapidity of climate change and global warming. Scientists are actually also trying to find different ways to help this, all this coral survive in this constantly changing world. Um, and the way people started to do this was to experiment with taking coral fragments and growing them in nurseries. So CCMI founded our nursery back in 2012 in partnership with the Cayman Islands Department of Environment. And since then, we have been experimenting with growing and returning different corals to the reefs, outplanting those corals. And we are constantly changing our methods so that we can find more coral that's going to survive and is more resilient to different stressors and diseases. Uh, Tom and Sabrina, are you guys still doing all right down there? Sabrina, all good? All good, thanks. Cool, and I am good, thank you. All right, wonderful. And Tom, could you give a reason? why CCMI likes to use staghorn coral in our nursery. I certainly can, Fiona. So compared to a lot of the corals we see on the reef around us here, like the different boulder corals and things, staghorn coral has a much greater growth rate. So where species like these may only grow in some circumstances, only a few millimeters per year, Staghorn coral can actually grow up to several centimeters per year, which means it's fantastic for the nurseries. Now we've also experimented with lots of different structures for the nurseries. 
So that means scientists can actually help grow the staghorn coral even faster. We're also able to outplant it in different places, changing some of the biotic and abiotic factors, like depth and things like that, to see how that affects the way the coral grows. Thank you, Tom. Uh, now, we touched on wanting coral to be resilient to disease a second ago, and Tom mentioned about the huge die-off that we had here in the Caribbean of staghorn and elkhorn coral in the 80s. Uh, we didn't know too much about the disease back then, but now due to new science, we know that white band disease is tied to an imbalance of bacteria on the coral surface. Now, in 2019, CCMI was actually able to observe this disease firsthand in our nursery, which is very unfortunate that, 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 that the disease entered our nursery, sorry. Um, but the silver lining about that was that we were able to observe which genotypes were resistant to the disease. And that means that in future, these are the genotypes that we're going to take and outplant onto the local reefs to help promote more resilient and healthier reefs. Tom, do you have any examples of any diseases or stressors that you can see around you? I actually do, Fiona. So you can see on these corals, so these colonies of staghorn coral here, there's actually some little white patches around, like for example this bit here. Now this appears to be where the coral has been preyed upon by another species, or a different one by a predator. And you can actually see of the white skeleton, that space is already being taken over by algae. Excuse me. Thank you, Tom. Uh, now we have another question that's just come in for you. So Serena wants to know if there is any bleached coral in Little Cayman. There have been mass bleaching events throughout the Caribbean in recent years and decades. So it does happen here as well. Thank you, Tom. Uh, now, we also want to let our audience know about a specific coral disease that is relatively new to the Cayman Islands. And this is stony coral tissue loss disease, which we may shorten occasionally to Skittle D. Now, stony coral tissue loss disease is a, has a devastating impact on our reefs, and this is because it affects so, so many different types of corals, and it also kills large corals very quickly because it is so rapidly spreading. Uh, Tom, do you see any examples of coral species that would be susceptible to stony coral tissue loss disease? I certainly do, Fiona. So, of the around 20 species that we have here in Cayman, that's affected by Skittle D. There's several examples right in front of me. Like, for example, this mountainous boulder coral to my right. We also have some lovely patches of different brain corals around throughout this area. And they are very highly susceptible. And unfortunately, Skittle D can kill off these entire colonies just in a matter of weeks. Yes, Tom, this is so urgent and so devastating. What a huge, huge impact uh, this disease could have on our reefs here in the Cayman Islands. Now, the Department of Environment is actually leading our country's response to through consulting with scientists from all around the Caribbean, and they're also working with larger and larger groups of divers uh, to help identify and then treat the disease with antibiotics in the same way that you or I, if we were unwell, could be treated by antibiotics. So they're asking all of us to help. Uh, and one way you can do this if you live in the Cayman Islands is to disinfect your gear, your dive gear, or your snorkel gear between dives or snorkels. Uh, and this can really help stop the spread of the disease. The Department of Environment does have guidelines, uh, and they're very, very simple, but so important to follow them. So we're going to include that link right now uh, in the chat. So if you haven't read that already, please go ahead and have a little look at that, because it is so vitally important for our Cayman Islands Reef. 
we do have a quick message coming in now, so we want to say hi to our friends watching from Cayman Prep and the island Montessori. We also want to say hi to the Ministry of Investment, Innovation and Social Development. So hi guys, nice to hear that you're watching. Um, and Tom, did you have anything that you wanted to add about Skittle D? Yes, Fiona. So it's really important that people not only appreciate how beautiful this ecosystem is here on the reef, but also how fragile and diverse and uh, how delicate it really is. So we, uh, we really want people to you know, appreciate that they can actually make a difference to the reefs here. And I'd really like our dive buddies back at home to have a think about what they can do to protect either the reef or even just their own local environment. Yes, Tom, so if you guys want to let us know anything that you do to help out our environment, um, feel free to just drop that in the chat box, and we would love to hear from you guys. Uh, so a little tiny thing that everyone can do, whether you live here in the heat or you live somewhere a little bit colder, is you can raise your AC a few degrees and drop your heating a few degrees. And that's not going to affect your environment too much within a house, a house but... Um, it will have a huge impact in terms of the amount of fossil fuels that we're using. Uh, another thing we can do is we can just walk a little bit more, bike a little bit more, take some more public transport where possible. And speaking of transport, we can try and get our food from local sources so that it doesn't have to fly or drive or go by ship thousands and thousands of miles to get to you. Rising global temperature has a huge impact on our reef health. That means that anything that all of us can do to combat that rising temperature is going to have a domino effect on our reefs. So even if it feels like you're very far away and you can't help the reefs, everything you do to help the environment does help the reef. Uh, Tom, do you have anything to add to that? Reuse, recycle. <laughs> So in my day-to-day -day life, I try to make sure I use less stuff. Like if I buy a phone, for example, I'll use it until the end of its life. I don't just want to upgrade it for the next and the latest model. Where I can, I'll reuse items as much as possible. And if I really have to throw something away, I'll try and recycle it where I can. I think it's really important people understand that these little differences they make day to day can add up to a big impact. And we're not asking people to be perfect. We understand that, you know, you're not always going to be perfect every single day, but it's just making that effort, trying a little bit every day to have, or to make a difference in your life. And as I said, it really, really does add up. Yes, thank you, Tom. Uh, what we can remember is we're not looking for perfection. We're actually just looking for effort from all of you guys. Now, we do have a quick question here from Heidi, who wants to know what diseases do we have in Cayman and what are their names? And we can't cover all of that, but I'm sure Tom could list a few for you. Uh, yes, yeah, certainly. There's quite a lot of different diseases, Heidi. But some of the um, really well-known ones are like white band disease, as I mentioned earlier, things like black band disease, Fiona was talking about Skittle D, the sto <laughs> stony coral tissue loss disease, which is a mouthful for one go. But yeah, there are a whole host of different things that affect the reefs here. That is true, Tom, and it would take far too long to list all of those diseases. We have another question from David from Pennsylvania, who wants to know what eats coral. Well, David, there are different snail species, different worms, even some fish, like we might, oh, well, no, not those guys, the um, sharks, but different butterfly fish and things like that. They'll actually pick off little bits of the coral too. So there's a whole range of different species that actually feed off it. A really famous one is the... Um, crown of thorn starfish and there's a lot of press about that one especially in places like australia and 
a quick follow-up question for you, Tom, there. If it is, uh, oh, excuse me, sorry, Sarah from Grand Cayman wants to know if this is a healthy reef, uh, and if it is a healthy reef, what it would it look like if it wasn't healthy? Well, so obviously, like, human impacts have been building up on reefs throughout the world, everywhere we go. So when we look at this and think it is fantastic, and it really is an amazing place, it has been impacted by human activities. So maybe back in like the 70s or the 60s or the 50s, it would have been even more beautiful. And that's what we would love to see again in the future. Yes, that is very true, Tom. Uh, but we are very lucky here to have a remarkably healthy reef compared to a lot of different places. Uh, now, I wanted to show you guys a few things that I personally do to try and have a better impact on the planet. So one of those things is I try and take little containers like this. This one's glass, so it's even more environmentally friendly, but if I'm going to go to a restaurant and I think I'm going to have a lot of leftovers afterwards, I'll try and remember to bring my containers with me so that I can take it home and not use styrofoam or other uh, single-use waste that they might give me to take leftovers home in. And I also like to take my reusable bags to the grocery store. This is a great example of one because it's actually very, very small, folds up and then unfolds and you get a full bag. So you can clip it on to whatever you're wearing, you can just tuck it into the back of your car or wherever you want, and those are two super, super simple ways that all of us can just have a tiny impact which adds up to a much greater impact on our Earth. Uh, Tom, we are almost out of time now. Did you have any last things you wanted to mention? I'd just like to say a big thank you to all of our dive buddies at home for joining us for Risco Life today. That's been fantastic. And thank you to our underwater camera team and our topside producers for making all of this happen. Thank you, Tom. We do have one last question for you, so those aren't quite your last words. Uh, but Arnav wants to know where we have seen disease at which areas in Cayman. Department of the Environment's been tracking that along the north coast and they were trying to prevent it from getting to Seven Mile Beach. I have seen little spots of different diseases here and there around Little Cayman, but you know, fortunately at the moment there's been nothing too much. Uh, yes, so thank you Tom and thank you for those kind words beforehand. It has been a lot of fun speaking to you. Uh, so that is basically all we have for today. We want to thank you all so much for joining us and for all of your lovely comments and questions. Uh, we hope you learned a little bit more about coral reef threats, namely rising temperatures and coral diseases, uh, adaptations in terms of how different genotypes are able to become more resilient to these threats, um, how scientists are trying to restore these coral reefs, and how all of us can pitch in and have a much more positive impact on the planet want to thank you all again for being our wonderful international dive buddies today. Uh, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that little bell icon to receive notifications. And we want to let you know about this very exciting, special World Ocean Day Reefs Go Live episode we have coming up on the 5th of June, um, which is called Stand Up for Reefs. The cool thing about it is that if you live in Grand Cayman, it is going to be broadcasting live to the cinema there. But don't worry, it's also going to be broadcast online for those of you who don't live there. But we would love to see all of you living in Grand Cayman if you came down and watched us on the big screen next time. So we're super excited and can't wait to see you all then. Bye, guys.